Hello, everyone. This will be your lecture on the transition from King David to King Solomon, and then most prominently, the introduction of the figure of the classic prophet in the history of Israel. Uh, we'll be looking at Elijah and his successor, Elisha, today. So we'll say a bit about the kingly transition, and then we'll focus mainly on the work of these two prophets in the early uh, monarchy period. Okay, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and there shall be created, and you shall renew the earth. O God, you've instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Under the inspiration of the same Spirit, grant that we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so you see a picture here of the older and younger prophet, the older being Elijah and the younger being his successor, Elisha, walking through the towns and countryside of Israel. First, though, we need to say a word about King Solomon. We really can't have an introduction to the Bible without mentioning something about the third king of Israel, David's son, King Solomon. A very important figure, particularly for the wisdom literature and the wisdom tradition in the Bible, the books of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, and in the Catholic Bible, the wisdom of Solomon are all attributed to this figure known for his wisdom. Okay, so King Solomon's story really begins with David growing old. Uh, there is a battle for his successor. David's power is waning, and so people are looking to uh, the future and trying to figure out who the next king is going to be. David has many sons. The clearest heir to the throne, Absalom, was killed. And so two of his sons at least moved to secure David's throne. The first one that's mentioned is a son by the name of Adonijah. And he moves to become king by gathering soldiers, weapons, chariots, horses, making alliance with different important people in Israel. And so it looks as though he is positioning himself to inherit the throne by sheer force in, and influence, political and military power. However, when the prophet Nathan discovers Adonijah's ambitions, he goes to David's wife, Bathsheba, you may remember her, and they form a plan to intervene in Adonijah's plans. They go directly to David and they convince him to name Solomon, Bathsheba's son, heir to the throne. And so David does. David says, your son Solomon shall be king after me and shall sit upon my throne in my place. And Bathsheba responds gratefully, may my Lord King David live forever. So with David's endorsement, with his explicit decree, Solomon becomes king after David um, dies. But before David dies, he gives a set of instructions to Solomon, some of which are pious and in line with David's admirable qualities, some of which are rather shocking and reflect some of David's more negative qualities. He tells Solomon that he always must keep the mandate of the Lord your God walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, commands, ordinances, and decrees as they are written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in whatever you do and wherever you turn. So that's, that's good. So be a good king, follow God's law. But he also says there are a few people out there that need to meet a violent end. He picks out his chief military leader, Joab, who was his friend and servant for a very long time. And this figure, Shimei, who was the one who was cursing David as he was fleeing Absalom. And David says, make sure that these 
two people do not go down to Sheol peacefully. Send them down to Sheol in blood, Sheol being the Hebrew name for the underworld, the land of the dead. So he's basically instructing Solomon to get rid of these people violently. And so Solomon does. Solomon has his servant Benaiah, his assassin, you might say, go and knock off Joab and Shimei. And after some give and take, he eventually gets rid of his rival Adonijah as well. And this guy, Abiathar. And the point of all this is that Solomon is acting to consolidate his power to be the lone undisputed ruler in Israel. So he solidifies his rule in this way. And uh, I'll leave it to you to make what you will of that. Solomon's early days are marked with wild success. Solomon rises and uh, builds upon his father's work as king. And even the Lord seems pleased with Solomon. Solomon goes to this place called Gibeon and offers a thousand burnt offerings. So quite a big generous sacrifice. And in response to this sacrifice, God tells Solomon that he will be given whatever he asks, a blank check. And so instead of asking for, well, a million wishes, which is what I would do, or for asking for worldly things like wealth, power, pleasure, long life, Solomon has a, a moving request. He says, give your servant a listening heart to judge your people and to distinguish between good and evil for who is able to give judgment for this vast people of yours. So this was one of Solomon's high points and the Lord God commends him for this request. He's given a wise heart, a listening heart, a discerning heart. This relates to the emphasis on heart in 1st and 2nd Samuel. The heart is really what matters to God. It also harkens back all the way to Eden because the sin of Eden is really to turn away from the true judgment of God with regard to good and evil and to determine for oneself what is good and evil. So to be a to have a listening heart means to be open and receptive, particularly to what is good and evil, what is just and unjust, not to be closed in and to determine for oneself what is good and evil, just and unjust, but to listen for it, to be open to it, to receive it from outside, from the Lord. So Solomon becomes a world-renowned uh, king. He becomes famous for his wealth, his power, and his wisdom. His riches are legendary. He extends Israel's influence. He's a great builder. He builds up Israel's military. And he also delivers judgments that become famous for their wisdom, prudence, and justice. And the picture in this slide depicts one of those where you had two prostitutes who both get pregnant, have their children. One of them dies when the woman rolls over on top of the child, sort of a tragic uh, premise for the story. Uh, the other woman's child is stolen by the woman whose child dies. So they go to Solomon and it's a dispute about whose child is this one living child. Solomon says, okay, Here's what we'll do. We'll cut the child in half, and each of you can have half of the child. One of the women says, fine, okay, sounds good. <laughs> the other woman says, no, she can have the child. Please don't do that. She can have the child. And so this is how Solomon knows who the real mother is, the famous story. So in chapter five, it says, God gave Solomon wisdom, exceptional understanding and knowledge as vast as the sand on the seashore. So everything about Solomon is extravagant. His wisdom, his knowledge, his wealth, his power, and also his 
faults and failings. And uh, we'll see that in a moment. The other thing Solomon does is he builds the temple. David, before he died, collected all the materials for the temple and the design was already in place. Solomon finishes the job and has the temple built over a period of seven years. He builds it on the highest point of Jerusalem, Mount Moriah or Mount Zion, two names for the same place. Mount Moriah is where Abraham sacrificed Isaac or almost did. Uh, Mount Zion is the, really the, the center point around which the city of Jerusalem grows. So the temple stands at the highest point and it's also by far the highest building. It's a grand structure. It's an adaptation of the wilderness tabernacle. So those same designs and specifications are preserved. It's just that it's now a permanent structure instead of a temporary mobile structure. He also extends Israel's borders and influence. <clears throat> so uh, I have a couple pictures here to show you this. So this is the temple that Solomon built and everything in it is some version of what was in the wilderness tabernacle, but more elaborate and permanent. There were designs or images added to the interior of the holy place. So this uh, first room that you would enter and the images depict or evoke images from Eden. So not only do you have the lampstands, which are both the trees that were in Eden, but also the burning bush, because the lampstands hold fire. There are also images of palm trees, angels, bushes, fruit. Uh, and this was meant to convey the message that this is a place where humanity and God dwell in right relationship with each other as they did originally at creation in the garden. It's a meeting place between God and humanity. It's a meeting place between heaven and earth. And inside the holy place, he also adds these uh, depictions of angels, which are really like, um, almost like sphinxes. They're lions with wings, but the ark is there inside of the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies. You have a much bigger, higher altar on which to sacrifice, uh, a much larger wash basin called the sea, which holds 12,000 gallons and is supported by 12 golden oxen. And everything else that was in the original tabernacle is there. The altar of incense, the table for the showbread, and... Um, it's a grand courtyard surrounded by a perimeter, a fence, just like the original wilderness tabernacle. So there's an image of Solomon's temple, which will stand from the year it was built. So, you know, it's disputed 955, somewhere around there, 953 to the year 587 when the temple is destroyed by the Babylonians. So um, almost 400 years. All right, here's a map of Solomon's kingdom. On the left, you see in purple, the original kingdom of Israel ruled by Saul. In the light blue, the bluish gray, you see the expansion that occurred under King David's rule. And even beyond that expansion, you have areas of influence, so almost like a buffer zone. And the names of the different peoples, like Ammon, Moab, Edom, these are subjugated people, so people who offer tribute, who are really under the rule of Israel, but who maintain their own culture. And um, Aram is another one. So David's sphere of influence goes all the way from the Gulf of Aqaba on the coast of the Sinai Peninsula all the way up to the Euphrates River in the north of Syria. So this is the high point of the Kingdom of Israel's expansion. It's the height of its power, height of its influence, height of its military strength. Here's another picture 
to give you a better sense of how large Solomon's kingdom was. In the red there, you have the uh, original territory of Israel before David came, became king. In the darker orange, David's expansion, and then the area under Solomon's influence in the lighter yellow. The kingdoms of, uh, Phine of Phoenicia in the north, where you see the city of Tyre, and the little block of coastland uh, to the west, Philistia, which is today the Gaza Strip. It's still kind of its own isolated uh, block of land, not under Israel's rule. Okay, so it gives you a sense of how far Solomon's empire expands. Then an extremely important event in the Bible. Israel splits into two kingdoms. It doesn't happen under Solomon. Solomon rules for 40 years, it says, just like his father. So from around 960 to around 920 BC. And Solomon, though he kept this kingdom intact, set the stage for its breakup, for its division. And his main weakness, it seems, is for women. So Solomon's weakness, particularly for foreign wives, eventually leads the people away from the Lord because he not only takes these foreign wives, he allows them to maintain their own idolatrous practices. <clears throat> he becomes very fond of them. And as happens in the situations of marriage, one of the spouses influences the other. And so Solomon comes under the influence of alternative rites and religions. Um, he begins to actually worship the other gods that his wives worship. So you see a picture there at the bottom of uh, King Solomon as an old man. And there are temples. There are idols set up in Israel to the gods his wives worship. So it says that he had 1,000 wives from all over the world. I don't know how he would have the time but that's what it says. He has a thousand wives and they turned his heart to follow other gods. And his heart was not entirely with the Lord as the heart of David had been. And part of this makes sense. If you have this many uh, attachments, then your heart is going to be pulled in many different directions. And it was pulled away from the Lord which should have been his, his primary object of, of devotion, his primary attachment. So he allowed and even participated in the worship of foreign gods, gods like Astarte, Moloch, and this set the stage for the downfall of Israel, just like in the book of Judges, when you begin to have <clears throat> idolatrous practices, when you begin to turn to other gods, then things start to go badly. The other thing Solomon did to set the stage for the breakup of the kingdom was to heavily tax the poor. So he particularly liked to impose labor taxes, so taxes paid through labor, which is really just a form of forced labor. He built roads, he built towns, he built fortresses, he did a lot of building, and to accomplish this, he gathered both money, resources, and people to get it done. And here you see Samuel's predictions about kings coming true. To accomplish his goals and aims, he basically takes from the people whatever he wants. And he takes and takes to the point where the people become very discontented, particularly the poorer tribes in the north, in the north of Israel. In a sense, Solomon, at the end of his life, comes to resemble Pharaoh more than he does Moses or even his father, David, you know, surrounded by this huge harem of women with wealth, power, a sense of absolute authority. He takes from the people what he wants. He reduces people to forced labor, form of slavery, basically. And so you get a picture here of Israel's king descending to the same place uh, as the Egyptians. Um, Solomon seems to be more like Pharaoh than a good king. Solomon's successors named Rehoboam, his son and heir, he rules for 17 years, and under his leadership, things go from bad to worse. 
the northern tribes go to Rehoboam and ask for tax relief, ask for relief from this forced labor, this indentured servitude. Rehoboam, in a very flamboyant, bombastic way, refuses their request, just like Pharaoh. I'm going to make even more work for you. And as a result, the northern tribes secede, basically. They break from their loyalty to the throne of David, and they take a new capital called Samaria. And there were 10 of these tribes that broke off, so almost all of them. And the only tribes left in the kingdom, what will come, become the kingdom of Judah in the south, are the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. So in breaking from, is from in breaking from Judah, from the United Kingdom, the northern tribes say, what share have we in David? We have no heritage in the son of Jesse. To your tents, Israel, now look to your own house, David. So you look, take care of things in the south and Jerusalem, and we're going to go our own way. We don't want to have anything to do with David, and by implication, this covenant or promise God made to David. So Jeroboam becomes the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. So you have Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and these are two rival kings, both Israelites ruling separate kingdoms. Jeroboam proves to be no better than Rehoboam. In fact, he makes two golden calf shrines and sets them up in two cities in the north and says to the people, you have been going up to Jerusalem long enough. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So the Israelites in the north couldn't freely go into Jerusalem since the kingdoms were divided. So Re Jeroboam's solution is, oh, I'll just set up these temples with a representative of the Lord, namely two golden calves. And the correspondence to the incident in uh, at Mount Sinai, where Aaron makes a golden calf, is unmistakable. Uh, Jeroboam even says, here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. It says the exact same thing that Aaron says. So they're basically permanently instituting the act of idolatry that made the Lord so angry and made him want to completely wipe out all the Israelites. This becomes a permanent thing in the north. So you see the kings turning away the kings are descending into a place of corruption, idolatry, faithlessness. And here's a map of the divided kingdom. So you see in the green there, the kingdom of Israel in the north, and in purple, the kingdom of Judah in the south. So they split from each other. I also included this map on the right here to show you a little bit of the topography of this place we've been talking about. Uh, there are high points just west of the Jordan River, which cuts a valley from the Sea of Galilee or the uh, Sea of Gennesaret all the way down to the Dead Sea. But then in the north uh, west part of Israel, you see this point right here, this promontory called Mount Carmel, and this will become important for the story we're about to tell later. Okay, so now enters the first major prophet in the template or in the paradigm of the classic biblical prophets from this point on, Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite. And it's in response to the king's, both kings, faithlessness, that the Lord raises up this prophet. The word of the Lord comes to Elijah the Tishbite. We don't really know what a Tishbite is, if it's ethnic, if it's geographical, but Elijah the Tishbite becomes God's messenger, God's mouthpiece, and the first thing that he does is to proclaim a drought, and he proclaims a drought to King Ahab, who was the worst of the kings of Israel. It says this several times, and he rules alongside his wife Jezebel, they almost rule as a couple, and they're both evil. Jezebel, in particular, is from a place that uh, worships an idol, an, another god by the name of Baal, and she gets her husband Ahab to 
give himself over completely to the worship of Baal. So Elijah comes to Ahab and proclaims a drought. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, he says, during these years, there shall be no dew or rain except by my word. Now you can imagine this was not well received by either Ahab or Jezebel. And so Elijah has to flee for his life. The immediate response is, okay, Elijah, time to die. And he has to run into the desert. And this is more than just a practical strategy. Elijah, for the most part, <clears throat> lives on the margins, lives outside of the mainstream society. He lives out in the desert. He lives on the margins. He hangs out with the poor, the dispossessed. And um, he's depicted in this picture here as wearing a hairy garment. This is particularly important to Christians. He wore a hairy garment around him secured by a belt. And in the early parts of all of the Gospels, you have a prophet, namely John the Baptist, who is attired in the same way wears a garment of animal skin, of fur, and is secured by a belt. We don't know if this is the mantle of Elijah that we'll talk about later, but uh, that's how Elijah was recognized. He wore animal skins. So when he flees, he goes to the desert, <clears throat> and since there's a drought, water's a problem. Since it's the desert, food's a problem. He gets food and water sent to him by the Lord. So he's placed at this wadi, which is uh, like a riverbed that fills up when it rains in the desert. But miraculously, this riverbed still has a little trickle in it. And this is where he gets his water. The food is brought to him directly by a raven who brings him bread and meat to survive. Eventually, though, the water runs dry because of the drought. And so... Elijah is sent into a town called Zarephath. And in Zarephath, he's sent to a poor widow who, like many other people in the town, is about to starve because of the drought. So she's about to starve. She's making her last bit of bread for her and her son. And then that's it. They'll just wait for death. Elijah, though, comes to her and makes an odd request. I know that you're preparing your very last piece of bread to eat before you consign yourself to starvation, but could I have some bread? <laughs> he asks for some water and some bread from her. And as a kind of incentive, he says, if you do this, your food will not run out. He promises her that if she gives the little she has, her food will not run out. So place yourself in her position is she going to give to this stranger some of the very last food that she has, not only for herself, but for her son? But she does. And her flour and oil miraculously remain intact, and she has enough to continue to eat and survive until the drought is over. And many biblical commentators go to this story as uh, a truly remarkable demonstration of faith that when the Lord asks you to give at the point where you have not even enough for yourself, this is when God's generosity becomes most abundant and transformative. But then after uh, this happens and Elijah is brought into her house for a while, her son becomes ill. And it seems as though he may have even died because he stops breathing. The woman goes to Elijah and says, have you found out some secret sin of mine and are now punishing me for it? So you can imagine that her hospitality might wane at this point because she connects her son's illness and possible death to Elijah's presence. Elijah though takes the boy into an upper room of the house calls out to the Lord, and then stretches himself out on, on the boy himself, and his breath returns to him. He starts breathing again. So you have here what amounts to a, a resurrection. He brings this boy back from either death or the cusp of death, and um, 
gives the boy back to his mother. It's a very moving story. Okay, so that's the first part of Elijah's story. The second part is a little more public and a little more uh, colorful, let's say. Uh, so the time comes for the Lord to end the drought, and he plans to do so dramatically through a kind of public contest, public demonstration of the Lord's power, particularly over this other god, Baal, who has the loyalty of the king and the queen and also of many of the people. So King Ahab and his wife Jezebel worship Baal, and Baal is the Philistine god of rain and fertility. It's very important, especially if you live in the desert. You see a picture of uh, Baal on the upper left there, an ancient engraving from uh, Philistia. And Baal has a club or hammer in his right hand that he uses to make thunder in the sky. And in his left hand, he has a thunderbolt. And the thunderbolt has a point at the end, but it sprouts into a kind of tree or vine at the top. And it's meant to show that he brings the thunder and the lightning, he brings the rain, which then creates the crops, the fertility. And Mount Carmel was especially associated with Baal. It was his place because it was very lavish and green. It rained a lot there. And so the place where it rains the most must be the place most under the influence of the rain god. And so this was uh, like his home base, you might say. Elijah goes to the king and challenges him to a contest on Mount Carmel, Baal's home turf. And the terms of the contest are that we'll set up two altars, one for Baal and one for the Lord. You bring your 450 prophets of Baal, and I'll just bring myself. And we will each pray to our respective God and the God who answers our prayers with fire to burn up the sacrifices we make on the altar is the true God. <clears throat> and the king readily agrees to this. And so the prophets of Baal go first, 450 of them. They begin praying to Baal. They say, Baal, Baal, hear us. They begin to dance around. They had this particular like limping dance that they did, a rain dance, presumably. And they even slash themselves with swords as a part of their prayer, trying to get Baal to answer with fire. And they do this for hours upon hours upon hours, and nothing happens. And in response to this, Elijah taunts them. He says things like, call louder, for he is a god. He may be busy doing his business. In other, it's just sort of a funny part of the Bible, sort of saying, maybe he's going to the bathroom, or maybe he's on a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. <clears throat> and they called out louder in response to uh, Elijah's taunts. So then it's Elijah's turn, finally, after the prophets of Baal give up. And Elijah gathers all the people to him and constructs an, an altar from 12 stones because of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob. And he has a trench dug around the altar. And he has water poured over the sacrifice that he makes on the altar. So much water that it runs down and fills the trench. So he has them do this three times, drenching his whole sacrifice and altar with water to make it as hard as possible for it to ignite. It's almost sort of like, well, I don't want anybody to say there was a random spark. If there's fire going to come from heaven, it has to be unambiguously supernatural. So then he calls upon the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel to answer him. And he mentions his purpose. He says, answer me so that this people may know that you, Lord, are God and that you've turned their hearts back to you. So it isn't just to show his superiority or even the Lord's superiority. It's in order to get the people to turn back to the Lord, to recognize that Baal is powerless. And at this time, there was uh, kind of divided loyalties among a lot of the people. They would worship the Lord alongside of Baal. They would sort of delegate to Baal the function of rain and fertility. 
So the Lord is coming along to show that even this little function is something that I do. This isn't anything from any other God. There's no other God but me. I do not rule the world alongside any other God. It's just me. So he's showing that what the people hope to get from Baal actually comes from the Lord. And so in response to Elijah's prayer, fire comes down from heaven and burns up not only the sacrifice, but all the stones on the altar and evaporates all of the water, even in the trench. I mean, it's almost, you almost get a sense like it's an explosion. Uh, all that's left is dust. <laughs> so it must have been quite a powerful fire. And in response to this powerful demonstration, the people proclaim the Lord is God, which I just want to pause and say that's really kind of remarkable because Elijah's name means the Lord is God. El is the uh, Hebrew word for God, like the generic name for divinity, and Yah is short for Yahweh. Uh, so it basically means that uh, the, the God is the Lord, or in, in our language, it would be the Lord is God. So they're actually yelling out Elijah's name, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, the Lord is God, the Lord is God, and it also happens to be <laughs> Elijah's name. So here's a picture of Mount Carmel today in the state of Israel, uh, a very large imposing mountain. Um, I'm not sure what kind of stone it's made of, but uh, it has lots of cliffs around it and it rises much, much higher than the surrounding territories. It's impossible to miss. If you ever go to Israel and go into the north, you'll be able to see it from a very long way off. So that's Mount Carmel where Elijah took uh, everybody up to and um, had his contest of sacrifices. All right, well, after Mo after Elijah wins, you know, you think he's in a powerful position here. He's shown everybody that the true God is the Lord and the Lord alone, but Elijah takes it a little too far. He leads all the prophets of Baal down the mountain and then personally kills all of them himself. So... The drought does end. The Lord sends a heavy rain from the sea. But when Jezebel hears that Elijah has killed all of the prophets of Baal, Elijah has to flee again for his life. And he goes farther south. He goes into the Negev desert to a little settlement called Beersheba. And you get a picture of kind of despondency or despair here. He sits under a broom tree, very meager shade, and prays for death. This is in chapter 19. He's basically throwing in the towel here and saying, I'm done. Um, he, he says, um, just bring death. Enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. And he lay down and fell asleep under the solitary broom tree. He also seems very weak. He can't go on. Maybe he was hungry and thirsty. The Lord sends him food and water miraculously again. He just wakes up and finds some bread and water right there for him. And this happens three times. And finally, the Lord says, time to go on your way. So he walks 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai in the wilderness. This is where Moses encountered God. And if you remember, Moses encountered God on Mount Sinai uh, in a dramatic way. So Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, there was fire, there was earthquake, loud noises, wind, dramatic display of God's presence. When Elijah gets to Mount Sinai, he takes shelter in a cave there, and he hears the Lord speak to him and say, why are you here, Elijah? It's a very enigmatic question. Well, I'm here because you sent me, but uh, maybe it was an invitation to introspection. Elijah gives an answer. He complains to the Lord. He says, Israel's forsaken the covenant. The prophets are all dead. They've killed them all, and I'm the only one left among them. So then the Lord tells him to stand on the mountain, just as Moses did, and that the Lord will pass by. So the Lord is going to manifest himself directly to Elijah here, just as he did to Moses. And just as he did to Moses, there's a violent wind there's a powerful earthquake, there is fire, but unlike in the story of Moses, it says here that the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the earthquake. 
the Lord was not in the fire. But then comes, after the fire, a light, silent sound. <clears throat> and we get a sense that the Lord is in this silence, not in the violent, dramatic displays of, you know, natural phenomena, but in this light sound of silence. It's kind of a paradoxical phrase, a silence that is so pure that it's almost a sound in itself. And just like Moses did when he came down from the mountain and his face was glowing, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. So once again, the Lord asks Elijah, why are you here? Elijah gives the same complaint and the Lord says, enough, go back. Take the desert road to Damascus. Um, I have work for you to do there. There is still hope. There are people who will help you, and I have spared 7,000 in Israel. Every knee that has not bent to Baal, every mouth that has not kissed him. So kind of contradicting Elijah's complaint, the Lord is saying there still are faithful people out there who have not worshipped Baal. So Elijah goes back to Israel. And by the way, Elijah is a prophet of the northern kingdom. So he's working in the northern kingdom here in Israel with uh, Ahab, who's the king of the north in Samaria. So the next part of <clears throat> Elijah's story involves a confrontation with King Ahab. It's really a confrontation of uh, Ahab's uh, conspiracy to murder one of his neighbors and then to steal his property. So Ahab goes to his neighbor Naboth, and offers to buy his vineyard. It's right next door to his palace, and he wants this nice lush vineyard. Naboth refuses, saying, the Lord forbid that I should give you my ancestral heritage. Ahab, it says, was disturbed by this refusal and couldn't eat or sleep, and so his wife abrades him and says, well, some kind of king you are. Uh, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. So she plans to frame Naboth for treason, so basically to get witnesses to say that Naboth uh, denounced the king, and she plans to have this done in public, and then to execute him because of the crime, and so this does, and uh, this, this happens, she carries out the plan, and then they take the vineyard upon Naboth's death. Elijah is told of what happened by the Lord, and he swings in and says, uh-uh, hell no, this is not going to go through. And you get a sense here of Elijah's anger. He was kind of a wild man. And here uh, he confronts King Ahab in the most uh, strident way. Uh, he's confronted anybody in the story says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and uh, his words to King Ahab, his, his opening salvo is, after murdering, do you also take possession? So the king confronts Elijah first and says, um, is that you, Elijah, my enemy? And Elijah says, um, you're the one who's done wrong here. Uh, Thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, the dogs shall lick up your blood too. So this is a pretty unambiguous death threat. The Lord is going to strike you down, and you will suffer the same fate as Naboth. And your wife too, against Jezebel too. The Lord declares, the dogs shall devour Jezebel in the confines of Jezreel. So, Elijah is really putting down the hammer here. And the narrator of the story confirms, indeed, no one gave himself up to the doing of evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Ahab, urged on by his wife Jezebel. Now, Ahab does respond. He gets the message. Instead of going after Elijah, he repents. He tears his garments. He puts on sackcloth. He fasts, uh, sleeps in the sackcloth. And so the Lord relents and does not kill him immediately, but reserves punishment for his son. In a similar way to, to Solomon. So the Lord plans to punish Solomon and take away his kingdom, split it in half. But this happens only after Solomon dies. 
Okay, so now we've come to the part where Elijah uh, passes the torch, you might say, and passes the mantle, really, to uh, his successor, Elisha. But even to the end of his life, Elijah rages against idolatry. You have this one last story of King Ahaziah, who falls through his roof somehow, injures himself, and then seeks help from uh, Baalzebub, which is just another name for Baal. And Elijah sends word that the king will not recover because he turned to the wrong god. The king sends soldiers after Elijah in groups of 50. Each time they come to him, Elijah calls down fire from heaven and kills them. The third group of 50, though, convinces Elijah to go back to the king, and Elijah delivers the message, and the king seems to uh, accept it, and he indeed uh, dies on his convalescent bed. So as Elijah nears the end of his life, he's followed around by this guy named Elisha. Elisha enters the story a little bit earlier. Elijah passes by his field. This is the picture in the upper right and puts his mantle briefly over Elisha. Elisha is moved or stirred by this because it signifies that Elisha is the next prophet that would come after Elisha. Elisha then goes and takes care of his affairs. He uh, sacrifices all of the oxen that he used to farm his fields. He tears up his plow and burns the oxen with the wood of his plow, basically abandons everything and starts to follow Elijah and follows him around to the point where Elijah tries to send him away. But three times in chapter two of Second Kings, so we're in Second Kings now, Elisha says, I will not leave you. When I read this this time, it really uh, made me think of Peter after the Lord rose from the dead, um, saying to the Lord three times, yes, Lord, I love you, because the Lord said, do you love me? Peter had denied Christ three times, during his passion, the Lord returns to Peter and asks, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Elijah, Elisha here, in response to Elijah's request that he go somewhere else, says, I will not leave you as the Lord lives and as you yourself live. I will not leave you. So it also reminded me a little bit of Jacob. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going anywhere. I'm holding on to you. And so finally, Elijah parts the Jordan with his mantle. What I mean by that is he takes off his mantle or his cloak and strikes the water with it. And the water of the Jordan River, which is really more like a creek, it's a very small river, parts. And so they cross over to the eastern side. And this is where Elijah is taken up into heaven. And Elisha sees this happen. But before, Elijah tells Elisha to request whatever he might do for him and Elisha makes a big ask. He asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elijah said, well, I don't know if that uh, can happen, but if you see me taken up, then your request will be granted. If not, then not. So Elijah does see something. He sees this fiery chariot in, in the sky with fiery horses take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. And the only thing that's left behind is Elijah's cloak or mantle. Elijah takes up where, Elisha rather, Elisha takes up where Elijah left off. And <clears throat> Elisha tears his own garment and puts on Elijah's mantle. So let's just say Elisha tears his own garment. So he gets rid of his old clothes and puts on the clothes of Elijah. So he's literally putting on the uh, prophet uniform here the hairy garment, perhaps, of uh, Elijah. So he's taking on the role of the prophet as Elijah practiced it in Israel. Elijah takes this mantle, goes back to the river, and parts it in the same way that Elijah parted it, sort of signifying that now he has the power of Elijah. And the people himself, the people themselves say the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Okay, so now Elisha performs miracles of his own. And so he's given a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and he actually performs twice as many miracles. And they record 14 miracles attributed to Elisha, as opposed to the seven of Elijah. Uh, so that kind of bears out just in the sheer quantity of the miracles he does. The first miracle he does is he goes to Jericho. They can't drink the water because it's tainted. 
<clears throat> and so he purifies it. He throws salt into it and purifies the water there. He also provides water to Israel's army. They're on their way to put down a revolt in Moab. They don't have any water. And so Elisha asks for a minstrel. And as uh, the music plays, he prays to the Lord and uh, the wadi nearby is filled with water so the armies um, can drink. He also multiplies the oil of a widow a lot of these miracles actually harken back to Elijah's miracles. A lot of them are very similar. In this case, um, a widow and her family are so poor that they're about to sell themselves into slavery. And Elisha says, well, go pour the oil that you have in your jug into uh, another vessel. So they do. And then it turns out that the oil is still in the first jar. And so they pour that into another jar. And he multiplies the oil of the widow so that she can sell it and have enough money to avoid slavery. There's another miracle, which is an explicit echo of the story of Abraham and the three strangers. And it's the story of the Shunammite woman. So there's a woman from this place called Shunem who shows Elisha hospitality in her home. And he, in return, Elisha tells the Shunammite woman that she will have a son. A year from now, you will have a son. Almost exactly like that story from Genesis with Abraham and Sarah. So she does. And um, the son, however, gets sick. And this is an echo of Elijah's raising of the widow's son. It's very, very similar. It's, it's almost exactly a parallel. So the Shunammite woman's son becomes ill and dies. And it seems unambiguous here. He's definitely dead. So Elisha closes the door prays to the Lord, and then lays on top of the boy. And it's very explicit here, in a sense, uh, quite moving. He lay upon the child on the bed, placing his mouth upon the child's mouth, his eyes upon the eyes, his hands upon the hands. As, as Elisha stretched himself over the child, the boy's flesh became warm. And Christians see in this image uh, the life that they gain from the humanity of Christ. So our life, which is uh, consigned to death, receives new life from Christ's humanity, who in a sense lays itself over our humanity. All right, he also po he cleanses a poisoned stew. So people pick the wrong gourd, put it in the stew, uh, he finds out about it and purifies the stew with some meal. He multiplies bread for a crowd, which is kind of a foreshadowing of a miracle that Jesus himself would do. And there's um, not only enough for everybody, but more left over than there was to begin with. So uh, just like the multiplying of the loaves and fishes in the Gospels. There's also the story of Naaman the leper. So Naaman is an army commander of the king of Aram, and he uh, has leprosy. So his wife's servant was a captured uh, Israelite, and she tells Naaman about Elisha the prophet in Israel. So Naaman gets permission to go and seek him out. The Aramite king sends word to the Israelite king about this request, and the Israelite king thinks it's a trap. He tears his garment because he thinks the Aramites are looking for a war, sort of saying, well, if you don't heal my army commander, then we're going to invade, because what's wrong with you? But uh, when Elisha hears that the king is upset, he comes in and sends for Naaman, and he tells Naaman to wash seven times in the Jordan River. Again, if you ever visit the Jordan River, uh, you may not be too impressed, because it's actually smaller than like the Lackawanna River. It's a very, very small river, almost like a creek. Naaman looks at this river and says, no, it's ridiculous. Also, Elisha doesn't even meet Naaman in person. He just sends a message through a servant. So this gets Naaman quite angry, and he turns around and leaves. He's like, I'm not going to go wash in that dirty creek. Uh, why didn't the prophet come out to meet me in person? So there's a sense of test of humility here. The gesture is too ordinary and humbling for Naaman, but his servants convince him to try it. Sort of like, well, what is there to lose? If he had asked you to stand on your head or do something extraordinary, you would have done it. But this ordinary gesture, why not just try it and see what happens? So he does. And when he washes in the Jordan seven times, 
It says his skin becomes like the skin of a little child and he was clean. So again, you see some Christian foreshadowing here. Jesus himself refers to this story in the Gospel of Luke, pointing out that Elisha healed only one leper in, in all of his ministry, and that it happened to be a Gentile. There were lots of lepers in Israel, but the prophet healed only one who was uh, not a Jew. Christians also see in this incident a kind of foreshadowing or anticipation of baptism, of, you know, washing in water and then being cleansed. And that, that, that phrase, becoming like a little child, to become clean and innocent like a little child. Christians come to believe the washing of baptism accomplishes this. Okay, so we've gotten through the assigned readings today. I thought I would at least introduce to you a chart that I found, somebody's nice, neat board work that uh, lays out quite nicely in one little picture, the role of the prophet. So we're being introduced to the prophet in these readings. So what is a prophet or a, a nahi or navi and the plural being nevi'im? See there in the uh, circled one there. The prophets are basically spokespeople or mouthpieces for God. So they speak on God's behalf. And the catchphrase of the prophet, as it says in the upper left-hand corner there, thus says the Lord. This is what the prophets always say. They deliver messages directly from the Lord saying, thus says the Lord. And what do they prophesy about? Well, they recall what God has done for the people, particularly the Exodus. They recall the law and Israel's covenant with the Lord. They then also confront present um, acts of faithlessness or idolatry, disregard for the Torah, and matters of injustice. And they also then look to the future, uh, foretelling how God will uh, deliver on his promises, punish uh, sins and injustice, and will ultimately bring about uh, a rule of, of peace and justice. So prophets are not fortune tellers. They are more like um, mouthpieces or surrogates for the Lord. And they deal not only in the future, but probably more so in the past and particularly the, the present. And so you see their division of the biblical prophets there. Um, and the major themes there at the bottom, things dealing with the land, so the land promise the differentiation between Israel and the nations. So uh, God is on Israel's side, but God can also turn against Israel if, if it breaks the covenant. The judgment that God places on the people and the promise of restoration. You can sort of um, sum it all up by saying the prophets are about delivering a message uh, to the people that the Lord is going to recreate, but it's going to be more like surgery. It's going to be invasive. And they have an element of, of destruction, uh, but in order to recreate. So what the Lord will take away and do away with is only for the sake of creating something better. So Israel will be restored. And ultimately, a right relationship of harmony and peace with the world will be restored. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you guys in class.